Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Farah Kiladar, and I'm the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. It is our honor tonight to welcome former President H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, and Mrs. Barbara Bush. Very welcome. It is our distinct honor. We'd like to give our special thanks to PwC for sponsoring this event at the patron level, and more specifically to Michaela Greenan, uh, who is with PwC and is the chairwoman of the uh, council board. Thank you. Our thanks also go to Judge and Mrs. Hughes and Charles Foster for sponsoring this event at the diplomat level. And of course, to all our supporters and members and board members. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to also give a shout out to um, Mike Yon from Sam Houston State University for underwriting uh, the books for all the students that participated in Conversations with History just prior to this event, where they had the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with John Meacham. So thank you very much for that. Another thanks goes to Ambassador Chase Untermeyer for accepting our invitation to participate in this event. Thank you, Ambassador. And my special thanks go to David Jones, who is a member of the World Affairs Council Board and principal at Dini Spheris for being instrumental in making this event happen. Please join me in welcoming David Jones to the podium. Well, thank you, Farah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special, very special evening program of the World Affairs Council. And of course, I join uh, Farah in welcoming uh, President and Mrs. Bush. We are honored to have you here. Thank you for being here. Tonight's program features the distinguished and Pulitzer Prize winning author, John Meacham. And as uh, Farah has mentioned, uh, Chase Untermeyer is also with us. And tonight will serve as the distinguished interviewer uh, on the stage. Welcome, Chase and, and John. I'll bring uh, Chase and John to the stage in, in just a moment, but if, uh, first a word or two about uh, our format. Uh, following the uh, interview and conversation on the stage, John will be very pleased to take your questions. We would ask that you write them out on the cards that were furnished. They're on the end of the rows, so if you're in the middle and you need a card, uh, just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. And our volunteers will circulate in about 30 minutes or so and uh, pick up the cards from you. And then Far and I will sort them some and, and uh, then we'll address the questions to, to John. So it was almost 50 years ago in 1966 that a young Harvard student named Chase Undermeyer served as a campaign volunteer in George Bush's run for Congress here in Houston. And therein was launched a 50-year outstanding public service career of his own and a long association with George and Barbara Bush. Along the way, Chase logged time as a political reporter for the Houston Chronicle, where we presume he wrote positive articles about his friend and future president. <laughs> Chase uh, served in the state legislature, and, before, uh, and then he moved to, to Washington in 1981 uh, to become the executive assistant to Vice President Bush. He then served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, moving back to the White House in 1998 as Director of Presidential Personnel for President Bush. And later, Chase became Director of Voice of America. Starting in, <clears throat> in 2004, appointed by President George W. Bush, Chase served for three years as the United States Ambassador to Qatar. We couldn't be more pleased to have Chase with us tonight to participate in the uh, program. Please welcome Ambassador Chase Untermeyer. Yeah. Welcome. 
When John Meacham was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 2009 for American Lion, his remarkable book on Andrew Jackson, a reporter at the press conference for the occasion asked him what the subject of his next book would be. And John replied, 41. Well, since that uh, press conference, uh, or at that press conference, I should say, uh, the broader world learned that uh, John was writing the book he'll discuss tonight, Destiny and Power, The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush. It would take him another six years after that press conference uh, to complete the book, uh, which in a few weeks since it was released has rapidly risen uh, to the very top of the New York Times bestseller list. John has also written highly acclaimed books on Thomas Jefferson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill. And some of you may know that he finished and had published the Jefferson book while he was writing the book on 41. That's multiple tasking at a <laughs> different level. John serves as the executive editor at Random House and was previously managing editor and editor-in-chief of Newsweek magazine. He's been awarded honorary uh, doctorates by Yale University and five other universities, and he lives with his wife and children in Nashville, Tennessee. So with all of that, as we welcome John to the stage, here's something that you might not know uh, about John. If you have read the book or read about the book uh, or seen him on countless number of, uh, numbers of interviews uh, on all the networks, you know that John had uh, extensive interviews with uh, President Bush. And he also had complete and unprecedented access to the diaries of President and Mrs. Bush. Now this access to the diaries has quite possibly made him, quite possibly the only person in America that Barbara Bush is afraid of. <laughs> He knows way too much. <laughs> Please welcome John Meacham. It is uh, particularly daunting, I should think, for John Meacham to be here while his subject is sitting on the front row. <laughs> This, this is something that he had not had to face with his books about uh, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, <laughs> or Franklin Roosevelt. It's true. And in fact, I think of those three, it would have been most dangerous to have Andrew Jackson because he fought duels. Very right? much so. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. But so much for that. And I, uh, if I had to single out any member of the audience, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Judge Hughes because we grabbed one of his copies of John's book so it could be up here for reference. I think, Judge, this is known as a takings. <laughs> and uh, in any event, a great, great pleasure to uh, have this honor. It's very daunting, too, because this seat has been filled in other places by the likes of George W. Bush, but we will uh, persevere and, and, and move onward here. Uh, welcome back to Houston, where you've spent a great deal of your time. I'd like to, uh, John, engage you in a series of questions on how certain factors shaped the life of your subject, George Herbert Walker Bush. Yes, so let's start at the beginning with his parents, Prescott and Dorothy Walker Bush. What right. was their role? Well, I think my favorite story is uh, in a moment of what we would call uh, wasp child abuse. Um, <laughs> Senator Bush once chased uh, Poppy Bush and his brother Prescott through the living room with a squash racket after they had paid Joan Williams a nickel to run naked through the house. <laughs> I think I have that right. Um, so you don't get many squash racket cases in juvenile court, um, only in Greenwich. Uh, I think that without, I mean, his parents are vital, obviously. Uh, I think his mother once broke her wrist while playing a tennis match, continued and won the match. Uh, so this is a formidable, a formidable woman. I think that they gave him uh, two sometimes competing imperatives. One was to serve, to do your duty, uh, the biblical injunction to whom much is given, much is expected, but also a ferociously competitive sensibility. Bushes were to serve, but they were also to succeed. They were to play fairly, play by the rules, but unquestionably 
Uh, the idea that life was a great contest was part of the ambient reality of life at Grove Lane. And um, there's also Mrs. Bush's legendary uh, injunctions not to talk about yourself, which makes going into politics an interesting career choice, <laughs> uh, to say the least. Um, uh, the stories are the uh, President Bush would come in and say, uh, I hit a double today, and she would say, well, how did the team do? Uh, don't be a braggadocio, George. Uh, no one wants to hear about the great I am. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that I believe halfway through the president's vice presidency, uh, he got a call after a State of the Union in which uh, Mrs. Bush said, George, what were you reading during President Reagan's speech? <laughs> And he said, oh, no, mother, I was, what you do is you follow along with the text of the president's speech, to which she said, well, wasn't President Reagan reading the speech? Couldn't you just listen to it? Um, and if you go through the YouTube, you will notice around about 1985, George H.W. Bush starts listening to the speech. Uh, so a, a formidable uh, force. Um, but I think that these were the two, these were the two forces. Uh, his father, interestingly, when you talk to either uh, President Bush, Jonathan Bush, Bucky Bush, um, uh, Mrs. Ellis, uh, uh, the Bush's sister, you hear two words repeatedly about, uh, about Prescott Bush. Tall, respected, uh, tall, respected. You hear this a lot. And um, I think there was a certain uh, discipline, there was a certain uh, sense of duty, but there was also a joy in that household. Uh, he, uh, Prescott Bush was a great singer. He loved music. There's a direct line between the Silver Dollar Quartet of Prescott Bush and the Oak Ridge Boys <laughs> um, uh, and, and the Bush's fondness there. So I think this was a household of, of great joy, of great love. And I also think that while love was unconditional, I do think that admiration was earned, and I think that that, that was imbued by, by the children, and they wanted to impress, they wanted to win, they wanted to do well. Um, and the other thing about that childhood, I think, which is vitally important, because there is a direct line between the George Bush, who was nicknamed Have Half, because whenever there was a treat or a dessert, he would cut it in half and give half to whomever he was with, which is a wonderful definition of what he ultimately brought to the diplomacy of this country. Ask Mikhail Gorbachev about this. You know, this is a, there's a vital sense of, there's a, a, a vital connection between those two. Uh, you know, this is a man who learned that thinking about the other guy was a virtue in and of itself. And uh, we have known fewer, more gracious or generous men in the Oval Office and I think it began at Grove Lane. You know, much has been made of the fact that President Bush comes from a privileged background, and there's no denying that. Uh, what effect did that have, do you think, uh, growing up in that kind of comfort during the Great Depression? Well, he did once say that, you know, the chauffeur had to drive uphill both ways <laughs> uh, to Greenwich Country Day School. Uh, and the, I think there were some reused tennis balls once. Uh, uh, but the fact... <laughs> I'll wait, it's okay. It's a pretty good line. Uh, it's his line, so. Um, to whom much is given, much is expected. Uh, there was a Bible verse every day. Uh, this was a family that was to serve. These are the most unspoiled, privileged people I've ever encountered, honestly. Uh, I, I, I think that, of, of, again, of the siblings, of Jonathan, of Bucky, of, of Nancy, Mrs. Ellis, uh, of Prescott Jr., these are people who came out of this incredibly uh, fortunate background believing they had a duty to serve others. And that doesn't always happen. Uh, I'm not saying these are perfect people. You know, these aren't five of the apostles uh, by any means. But I've, you would expect there to be an element of selfishness, an air of entitlement. This man would not have become president of the United States if he had come out of that childhood with an air of entitlement. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, he believed that every vote had to be earned, everyone had to be served, you had to think about everyone else. Uh, he was tireless in the pursuit of his goals, but once, and, and, and in that 
achievement of goal, there was an, a, a, a keen sense of duty that once one had power, you used, in the words of his prayer, an inaugural prayer he wrote of his own composition uh, in 1989, use power to help people. Uh, handwritten cards he pulled from his suit pocket on that day in January of 89. And so I was very struck by how unentitled the Bush family feels. He was, you know, and he worked so hard to win office, he once shook the hand of a department store mannequin in New Hampshire. <laughs> um, now, Lyndon Johnson would have tried to have registered him. <laughs> and God knows what Bill Clinton would have done. <laughs> I'm watching Mrs. Bush. I don't know. That was close to the line. Well, you uh, mentioned uh, service and duty. Yes, sir. What about his service during World War II? What role did that play in well, shaping his life? Uh, here, here we are a day after, aren't we? Uh, the uh, 74th anniversary. Uh, he was walking across Phillips Academy Andover, walking across the lawn. The news broke about 2.20, 2.25 p.m. that, sun that Sunday afternoon. Um, uh, he immediately wanted to serve. He told me once it was a red, white, and blue thing, that in a classic George Bush line, red, white, and blue thing. Um, he considered, he told me, going into the Royal Canadian Air Force because you could get in faster. And the United Kingdom was already obviously at war with, with Nazi Germany. He was prevailed upon to stay in, in school until the following June. On June 12, 1942, a Saturday, he turned 18 years old. He graduated from the Phillips Academy and he got in the car and drove to Boston and took the oath as a naval enlistee from a Yale football star named Walt Levering. Uh, who, um, and he'd had to have, this was a funny thing, one of the great joys of doing what I get to do is um, the archival side of things. And you had to have a recommendation for the Navy in uh, 1942 signed by your local police chief. I guess to say you weren't a delinquent. I don't know about, but, but, but the Greenwich police chief signed off, so that's good. Uh, we had that clearance. Um, he immediately goes off to Chapel Hill, uh, where he had a date one afternoon uh, with a young girl from Ashley Hall, uh, whom I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment, um, where they were forced into a, the, the stadium there because of a rainstorm. Uh, and. Um, was f stationed four or five different places. Obviously, the key moment was Saturday, September 2nd, 1944, when he's uh, on a mission in the Bonin Islands over Chichijima. He tries to take out, he takes out the tower he's to take out. The plane is hit by Japanese flak. He sees the, the wings of the plane go up in flame. The cockpit fills with smoke. He orders uh, his or or two crewmates to hit the silk. Uh, both those men did not make it, neither of those men made it. Del Delaney and Ted White were their names. In one of the many moments over the nine years President Bush and I talked about these things in which he wept, he said that he thinks about those men every day uh, and that he had two questions about them. One was, did I do enough? And the answer was yes, he had done everything that he was supposed to do. And the second, which is even more enduring, was why was I spared? Why was I spared? And as a biographer, I have a theory that one of the reasons for his tirelessness, one of the reasons for his endless devotion to service is that he has been trying at some level and to some degree ever since then to prove that he was worthy of surviving when others did not that he was commensurate with their sacrifice. Why was I spared? And I think his answer, I think his life is an answer to that question. Um, as he went out, uh, he, he, he bailed out. He was nearly decapitated. Um, he was gashed on the head, because of course he went out, but the plane kept going. Uh, plunges deep into the sea, uh, comes up. Fortunately, his life raft has fallen off his uh, fallen off him uh, nearby. He's out there for about four hours. Uh, if the wind and the tide had been blowing toward Chichijima as opposed to away from it, he might have become a prisoner of war. 
We later found out that that was a scene of horrific Japanese war crimes, including cannibalism. So at certain difficult domestic moments in the ensuing seven decades, President Bush has said to Mrs. Bush, you know I was almost in hors d'oeuvre, um, which is a hell of a card to play. Um, uh, he was rescued by the USS Finback, uh, spent a month on that, uh, on that submarine. Uh, I think it w he says it was one of the most life-changing experiences because he was living with the loss of his two friends, his two crewmates. His letters to his parents, which survived from the submarine, are incredibly moving uh, for a young man of 22 years old. Um, and I think he, uh, and he was ready to go back in August of 1945. Uh, they were in Norfolk, uh, and he was ready to rejoin and, and head, head back to the invasion of the home islands when Truman announced uh, VJ Day. Uh, zooming ahead, how much do you think that experience of being in combat, the last U.S. president to have been in combat, shaped decisions of war and peace when he was commander-in-chief? I think it was vital. I think uh, in his diary he talks constantly about the burden of putting other people's children in harm's way. Uh, there's, a, there's a very touching moment in the diary. He's upstairs in the treaty room, uh, which was he used as a study uh, in, in the residence. He had kind of an LBJ-like uh, uh, wardrobe with about six television screens, uh, which he watched. And the Sunday night before the air war began in 91, he watches as a father says goodbye to a son who's going off to get to go in theater into the Gulf. And his mind, in, uh, President Bush's mind, instantly goes back to his father taking him to Pennsylvania Station to go to Chapel Hill. And it was the first time President Bush had ever seen his father cry. And so there was this intimate personal connection. It was inextric inextricably linked, I think. His sense of responsibility as commander in chief was inextricably linked to his own combat experience. And I think he saw the Gulf War through two prisms, uh, one through World War II with his own sense of the, the preciousness of life, but also if you don't stop a dictator early, it gets harder and harder to stop them. And also through the prism of Vietnam, which is you don't second guess the generals, you give them what they need, sometimes even more than what they need, and you let them fight the war. And the Gulf War therefore has become a case study in how to fight wars since Vietnam. Well, now we get back to that young woman from Ashley Hall you uh, made allusion to before. Yes. And I'm not going to ask the easy question, uh, as Richard Nixon used to say, uh, of what impact Barbara Bush has had on uh, George Bush's life. Let me ask it this way. What difference did marrying her make in his life versus any number of other attractive young women from Greenwich named <laughs> Muffy or Buffy or Fluffy? Well, we have a list of, we have a, we, we have a list of some of them, uh, some of the candidates uh, uh, from, from the, they, they lost the primary. Uh, um, I, ha I, have a, I have a theory and I say this when, when Mrs. Bush is, is, is not in the room. Um, <laughs> So it has the virtue of being true, as Henry Kissinger used to say. Um, there are, when you do what I do, you always try to find the counterfactual moments. That's the fancy word for what if things had gone the other way. I'm convinced that of the two or three moments that led George Herbert Walker Bush to becoming president, that marrying Barbara Pierce was critical. I do not think he would have been president of the United States without her. Well, it is true, it, it, and this is, and as, I really don't. I don't. I don't. She kept the family together, body and soul, while he was building an international business, while he was running for office. Uh, she was a rock of strength. Uh, the diaries are shot through with this. Um, they came together stronger through a tragedy that many families do not survive which was the loss of their daughter Robin in 1953. Um, and one of the most moving things to my mind about their life story, when Robin was sick, George Bush couldn't stay in the hospital room because he couldn't stand to see the needles and the treatment. 
and afterward it was George Bush who helped put Barbara Bush back together late at night when she was sobbing and grieving about the loss of Robin. They were a perfectly matched team in the best sense of the best kind of marriage. And since you raised this, um, one of the few letters to survive the war between the two of them, this is what George Bush said about it. So Mrs. Bush, when I said she, he wouldn't have been president without her, she just said not true. So this is my, are there lawyers in the room? This is, this is my rebuttal witness, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. This is from September, this is December 1943. How often I have thought about the immeasurable joy that will be ours someday. How lucky our children will be to have a mother like you. As the days go by, the time of our departure draws nearer. For a long time, I had anxiously looked forward to the day when we would go aboard and set to sea. It seemed that obtaining that goal would be all I could desire for some time. But Barr, you have changed all that. I cannot say that I do not want to go to war, for that would be a lie. We have been working for a long time with a single purpose in mind, to be so equipped that we could meet and defeat our enemy. I do want to go because it is my part. Bar, you have made my life full of everything I could ever dream of. My complete happiness should be a token of my love for you. Good night, my beautiful. Every time I say beautiful, you about kill me, but you'll have to accept it. George Herbert Walker Bush. <laughs> Well, perhaps in partial answer to my question, if Mrs. George Bush had been named Muffy or Buffy and came from Greenwich instead of Barbara Pierce, might she have kept young George in Greenwich? In Greenwich. And well, if that had happened, might he, would he have become president? Well, this one, another moment. Now, when President Bush and I did, uh, did these interviews, it was like the world's worst wasp-on-wasp -wasp therapy. Um, <laughs> he would cry, I would cry. Jean Becker would come in the office, she would cry. Uh, she's a Catholic, so that kind of, that, that, she was the diversity uh, in the room. Um, but moving to, the other counterfact, the other moment is, I think if he had not moved to Texas, he would not have been president. He would have been a New England Republican, and we know how well that worked out. Uh, there are three of them left. Um, it takes a moment, but they're okay. They're there. This one, one of them, that mannequin in New Hampshire. The mannequin in New Hampshire, exactly, yeah. That, that was, uh, the, uh, no, I, I think that if the, t the move to Texas in 1948 was vital. Um, Mrs. Pierce uh, in, in Rye was so convinced they were moving to the frontier that she sent boxes of soap and laundry detergent, <laughs> uh, not thinking that you all had that. Um, so, but, but one, of the, one of the teary moments was, I once asked President Bush, did you have any idea that Mrs. Bush could be this strong? Because what, what, I, I won't get the numbers right, but something like 37 moves in 42 years or something crazy. Um, and he immediately broke into tears and said no. Um, he said that she was, a, you know, she was a debutante from Rye. Who knew she had it in her? Uh, but obviously he did. Uh, and I think that that's... Uh, and I'm not being sentimental about this because, as, as Chase just said, a couple of different life decisions, including even after being in Texas for about five years, uh, Brown Brothers Harriman made one more, one more pitch to come back. And it made a heck of a lot more sense for George and Barbara Bush to live in Greenwich or Larchmont or someplace and read The New Yorker and play a lot of golf and tennis and that was their cultural reality. Uh, but, they, but as I asked President Bush once, I said, you know, why did you do it? And you know, that big left hand, he said, it just wasn't different enough. You know, I, I wanted to make my own goals, make my own way, and not be in the shadow of his grandfather, G.H. Walker, or his father, uh, Prescott Bush at Brown Brothers. Perhaps it could be said that the most important 
day in George Herbert Walker Bush's political life was July 16th, 1980, yes. which was when Ronald Reagan... 11.37 p.m. <laughs> Very good, well, and we're told with some reluctance... We'll be on Jeopardy later. <laughs> Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, asked uh, George Bush to be his running mate uh, with limited enthusiasm because they had been opponents and, and somewhat fierce opponents in the uh, primaries that preceded. But there was born a famous political team. And what would you say Vice President Bush learned from Ronald Reagan? I think he learned uh, steady as she goes. Uh, I, think President, I think Vice President Bush was always impressed with Reagan's focus on a few big goals. Um, I think he was, and I use this word advisedly, I think he was impressed, even intimidated, by Reagan's command of the bully pulpit and the ability to communicate. Um, he says once or twice, you know, Reagan would, you know, raise fees or raise taxes or make a compromise and go out and give a speech saying he would never do that and everybody would go yay you know uh, he just had this phenomenal political ability to to compromise uh, without his own base Reagan's own base thinking he was compromising um, I did find I'll, I'll admit I, I was sort of expecting to do the vice presidency in about a week um, and sort of keep moving. And I ended up spending several months on it because I found that Vice President Bush was a much more important figure in those years, uh, particularly on foreign policy. Um, critical in, in, in convincing the um, European nations to accept the deployment of the Pershing Twos, which was a vital step ultimately in, in the, the end of the Cold War. Um, he was certainly much more part of Reagan's ambient day-to-day -day reality. Uh, several, uh, Boyden Gray and others, made the point that Reagan and Bush, uh, Bush was in and out of the Oval Office with a kind of casual uh, familiarity that had surprised me a, a bit. Um, and I think he learned, A, how to compromise, and B, the, um, the centrality of trying to keep your political base together. Then what fell apart in 1990 with the abandonment of that the... That base, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Reagan was, you know, President Bush once said to me that he felt somewhat lost between the glory of Reagan, the great hero, the trumpets everywhere, and the trials and tribulations of his sons. Um, and I disagree with that and just gave you 830 pages. This is about why. Uh, so it's, it's not a briefcase. Uh, but Reagan was able to compromise but keep the base believing that his heart was really with them no matter what. Uh, President Bush, as a clinical political matter, uh, had to break with the base on that. And enough of them said, see, we told you. Um, uh, I think that President Bush was a, I don't think he was a moderate. I think he was a moderate conservative. I think he was like Eisenhower and President Ford. I don't think he was a movement conservative in the way uh, Goldwater or Ronald Reagan was. And so a, when the moderate conservatives uh, who were important enough in the party in July of 1980 that not only did Ronald Reagan need George Bush, but he had first tried to get the ultimate moderate conservative for himself to get on the ticket. Um, uh, I think that once that was broken, you had the extremes, extreme part of the base, chiefly Newt Gingrich, uh, lead a revolt that severely weakened the presidency in a way that I don't think George Bush in his own political reality could understand. This is a man who, in representing the 7th District of Houston, his best friends were Democrats. Sonny Montgomery of Mississippi, Rosty of Chicago, Lud Ashley of Ohio. He played paddle ball with them. He kept his locker in the house gym as president sat around in the sauna with them. That doesn't bear much thinking about, but, uh, um, you know, it just, what it, when he becomes president, what do the Bushes do? They invite every congressman they can think of down 
to the uh, Lincoln bedroom, and in, in an early selfie, George H.W. Bush takes a Polaroid one step and takes pictures of all of them on the grounds that anyone will keep a picture taken by the President of the United States. Um, when I tried to explain what a Polaroid one step was to some <laughs> students recently, I got blank looks. <laughs> Which reminds me, just parenthetically, I, I teach at Vanderbilt, and for some reason, last term, um, we were talking about student newspapers for a brief moment. And I said, well, what we used to do is we used to cut the copy out and paste it, and then it would go to the printer. And a young woman raised her hand and said, oh my god, that's where cut and paste comes from. <laughs> and I thought, I'm just too old. I'm too old. I didn't even try to say what carbon copy was. You know. <laughs> They thought that was global warming. <laughs> but Gingrich, but, but if, you're look, if, if you're looking for a moment that helps set up the politics we have right now, uh, th that late October, early November day, when George Bush, Tom Foley, George Mitchell, Bob Dole, Dick Darman, uh, Jim Sasser, uh, when they go out to announce the budget deal, and remember what's going on in late October, November 1990. We're building up an army in the Middle East to reverse Saddam. Uh, there's a recession on the horizon. Uh, the president has decided that the national interest requires breaking a campaign pledge, that he thought, he, he thought the substance was more important than keeping the pledge, just as a matter of keeping a pledge. Um, CNN does a split screen where Newt Gingrich goes out the other door uh, the front door of the White House while the president's in the Rose Garden making this announcement. Gingrich goes up to Capitol Hill and there's a rally of uh, Republican extremists. Uh, I shouldn't say extremists. Uh, extremists. Um, but here, here's, here's one, of the, one of the great moments that, that for me in this was, um, in, in, in understanding this, was a story that Vin Weber told me, the congressman from Minnesota. Um, when you think about the wing of a butterfly that causes a hurricane, uh, the 1989 defeat of John Tower as Secretary of Defense is a hugely important moment in American politics. So follow this bouncing ball. John Tower fails to become Secretary of Defense. George Bush reaches out and grabs Dick Cheney out of the House leadership to become Secretary of Defense. That leaves an opening for the Republican whip. Newt Gingrich wins that job which puts him on the leadership uh, track. When Newt won the whip job, as ever, characteristically, George Bush invites Newt and Vin Weber, and Vin had run Gingrich's campaign within the caucus. And as Vin Weber said, no one ever invited the guy who ran the campaign. You know, the president never knew who that was, but George Bush did. He invites them over to the White House residence for a beer. So the three of them are sitting around. This is Vin Weber telling me this story in the last year or so. And they can tell that President Bush has something he wants to say, but he can't quite say it. And so as they're leaving, Weber says, Mr. President, tell us what worries you most about us. And relieved to have the opportunity, the president says without hesitating, I worry that your idealism may get in the way of what I think of as sound governance. I'm going to say that again. I worry that your idealism may get in the way of what I think of as sound governance. And Weber said he's always appreciated that the president didn't say extremism, purity, nuttiness, <laughs> ideology. He said idealism. He gave them the credit. He thought about the other guy. Half, half Bush gave them the credit that these were their ideals. This is what they believed, but that he as president was not just the president of the Republican Party, or much less the House Caucus, but the president of the country. And he had an, a larger obligation to sound governance. And that when he broke the pledge, when, when circumstances changed, he Weber immediately thought of this moment and realized that that's what George Bush had been talking about, that it was a moment for sound governance. 
I want to get to the audience questions, and as the blue cards are being brought up, uh, President Bush is always bridled at the L word for yeah. legacy. But you have done a fine job in this book of coaxing him uh, to talk about that. And what would you say is his legacy, and what does he think his legacy is? I think it's interesting because uh, I think President Bush and President Obama, of all people, uh, agree on this. Um, I think his legacy is that he put the country first. That while all political lives are marked by compromises, capitulations, colorations, on the road to power. That's just the nature of politics. Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address reassured the southern states that slavery was safe. That's the great emancipator. Uh, so every, Thomas Jefferson was very much against federal power until he had federal power, um, uh, and, and, which is a common presidential characteristic, actually. Um, but what I, think, what I think will stand President Bush in enormously good historical stead is that he tried to, though he was a tough campaigner, he, was, um, he didn't get everything right along the way. When he had power, he tried to do the right thing. He opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act when he ran for the Senate in this state in 1964. But what does he do in 1968 when he has power? He votes for open housing, lifting racial discrimination from the housing market. He came down here to Memorial High School and faced an angry, angry crowd of people using all kinds of words that shouldn't have been used then and can't be used now. We didn't send you up there to help these people, that kind of talk. And he quoted Edmund Burke to them saying that a representative does not simply owe you his, a reflection of your will, but he owes you his best judgment. And this man's best judgment was that he could not go to Vietnam as he had done in 1967-68 and look at African American soldiers who were fighting for their country and tell them they couldn't buy a house wherever they wanted to buy a house. 1988 was a tough campaign. It was a tough, brutal campaign in many ways. But what does he do the moment he becomes president? He tries to create a culture of consensus and compromise that gave us the Clean Air Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act. I had a deaf man walk up to me in Seattle 10 days ago with tears streaming down his face with, a, with his sign translator saying that George Bush had changed this man's life by making it possible for him to go into the workplace and have someone translate for him. Um, the 1990 budget deal, which, you know, as I said, Bill Clinton will tell you at length, which is redundant, <laughs> uh, that it set the terms of the prosperity for the 1990s. What he did with power is what his legacy is. And with power, he always did everything he could to put the country first. And that's his legacy. Well, thank you, John Meacham, Meacham. and uh, we will now go to questions from the audience. Uh, thank you for submitting the cards. Are we going to have the mellifluous voice of David Jones read these, which means I can take a breather here. Yes, good. We, we will tag team here. Uh, first question, um, how did his time as head of the CIA shape his foreign policy? Uh, we talked about that uh, at some length. I think that it, it shaped it in two ways. One was he learned the possibilities and the limitations of intelligence. I think that President Bush became very fond of the satellites, of the electronic intelligence. I think he was less enamored of the human intelligence product as it tended to come up. Um, as he once put it to me, the great thing about the CIA is they can tell you where the armies are massed, but they can't really tell you what those armies are going to do, which is part of what happened in the summer of 1990. And so I think he, he learned. He also, I mean, as you know, you know, he was there for barely a year, and they named the building after him. Um, I think you're on your way up there, actually, for, for the anniversary um, of your term. 
but he was there for a single year and was immensely popular, uh, partly because he shifted, this is a classic George Bush moment, he shifted the pronoun. It wasn't we and them or you, it was us. And what CIA veterans of the time will tell you is that it shot through the building like a rocket. The first morning he came in, put down the New York Times and said, what are they trying to do to us? And the fact that the CIA had a director who saw them as us was something that lifted morale around the world. We recently had Senator George Mitchell here. And when asked about the state of governance and the state of the US government uh, today, he commented that the US politicians have moved from uh, governing to running for elections. Reading your book and having lived through uh, Mr. President Bush's years, it is obvious to us that he was the epitome of as quote unquote sound governance, uh, of thinking of the other guy as you put it. What would you say about the current candidates running for office and more specifically Jeb Bush? Careful, Mrs. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer that historically. <laughs> when Millard Fillmore, um, I think that what I think that what has happened to, and let me just because this has some relevance. I do think that what happened under President Bush's feet, in many ways, as president, has given us the world we have now. And there were there there are three three quick factors. One is the rise of reflexive partisanship, freelance partisanship. The idea that Newt would walk out the front door. George Bush wouldn't have walked out of Lyndon Johnson's White House as a Republican. He would never have shown that disrespect to the presidency, ever. He vote, George Bush voted, as congressman from the seventh district, he voted with Lyndon Johnson 53.5% of the time. And then it skyrocketed under Nixon to 55%. Um, the, the diary, particularly Mrs. Bush's diary, is full of moments where President Bush, because Lyndon Johnson, let's not sentimentalize 67, 68. I mean, Lyndon Johnson was under enormous fire, so much so he didn't run for re-election. Uh, Congressman Bush was always eager to make the point to President Johnson that I'm never going to attack you personally. Uh, and you had a moment there where Republicans were basically with Johnson on the war and against him on the Great Society. So the idea that a president could be half right, half wrong, depending on the issue, was George Bush's ambient political reality. That was the world he grew up with and the world his father had known in the Senate. That changes because suddenly Again, the Gingrich world is one where you're 100% right and the other guy is 100% wrong. George Bush did not think about politics in terms of war. That's the only word the current, uh, you know, the, that the Republican right used. And it's a, a similar problem on the left, uh, unquestionably. Um, so you had the rise of this freelance partisanship where Gingrich was giving speeches on C-SPAN to an empty chamber to build up his own support. The second thing you had going is the rise of the 24-hour news cycle. Now, President Bush didn't have to deal with the internet, but he did have to deal with cable TV, opinion journalism, uh, talk radio was all on the rise. And the third is, is what I think of as the confessional politics, the personal branding. Um, you know, a moment that I found so moving, and I put it in the prologue of the book, actually, was when President Bush was vice president. He ends up in a children's leukemia award on a visit in Krakow. And he realizes where he is, and the press is right behind him. And he starts to cry for all the understandable reasons. And he won't turn around, because if he turns around with tears in his eyes, the moment becomes about him not about them. His innate sense of dignity kept him with his back to the cameras until he could control himself. And he says in his diary, 
I hope this little kid I'm sobbing over just knows that I love him. There are not many politicians who in the pursuit of building a personal brand who would not have turned around. And we've gone from a moment where we had a vice president and a president who refused to even think about branding himself to a Republican front runner in the polls who is nothing but a brand. Um, John, why do, you, why do you think President Bush felt compelled to criticize Cheney, Rumsfeld, et cetera, uh, and George W.'s strategy in the, in the Middle East? You're being an iron ass, David. <laughs> no, uh, not my question. Somebody, somebody else. Um, I, I think that uh, President Bush first made the, the comments that got some attention um, uh, about Rumsfeld, Cheney, uh, in October of 2008. Uh, that was the first time, and then we talked about that subject for the ensuing four years. Um, off and on. I think that it's the same reason he kept a very precise, historically vital White House diary. I think he believed, I think he believed it, A, so the truth is always a good thing. I think that he wanted a historical record that accurately, accurately reflected what he thought. I want to be very clear about this. What he was saying was not that he disagreed with his son's decisions on foreign policy. Quite the opposite. This former director of Central Intelligence wrote two letters to his son. And believe me, former directors of Central Intelligence do not write letters they do not expect to be in the historical record, in which he says that his son is doing what his son has to do, and that he's made, quote, the right decision, uh, given the circumstances given the strategic environment after September 11th, which, as President Bush said to his son, you are facing problems that no president since Lincoln or FDR has faced because you're talking about bloodshed on American soil. So for people who, in drive-by ways who thought this was a criticism of President Bush 43's foreign policy, that's not true. What it was was a commentary on the tone of the administration, uh, and George Herbert Walker Bush took a different tone. And so I think, uh, I think it was what he thought, it's what he believed, and he wanted the record to reflect that. And right now, Dick Cheney's probably got a t-shirt that says iron ass, so <laughs> he's fine with it, you know. <laughs> I write 834 pages and my contribution to American historiography is it sounds like a gym. <laughs> I got a new membership over at Iron Ass. Well, here's possibly a, a better way to shape uh, American uh, political history. We have a question from Memorial High School, a student. In 2016, our country will be electing a new president. The readers of your books have learned about presidents that span the timeline of our country's history. What common character traits do these presidents share? And what would you like your readers to take with them into the voting booth when picking their next president? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I'll, give one, I'll just answer one because it's so important right now. Nobody is always right and nobody is always wrong. Uh, compromise is the oxygen of democracy. Ask James Madison if you disagree. Um, being able to govern requires a balance of competing interests, not demonization and reflexive partisanship. And Thomas Jefferson, every night when Congress was in session, he had members of Congress to dinner because he believed that it would be harder to demonize those with whom you had had dinner he thought that caricatures cracked over dessert. Uh, he understood the value of personal relationships in government and in the process of governing. So I would look for a president. The president I would want to vote for would be someone who has had experience. By the way, at what point did 
becoming a member of the establishment simply mean that you go into the political arena and win an election? <laughs> why, 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 I don't understand that. Um, why is experience a bad thing? Um, I missed that chapter somewhere. Um, so that, that drives me slightly crazy. Um, that's a technical historical term uh, as well. You need people who will take 60% and then go back and fight for the 40. Um, you need people who have been around and understand the temperament of legislators, the temperament of a public. And the presidency is not a place, it's not an entry level job. It's just not. <laughs> Sounds like Jeb Bush to me. <laughs> a few more questions? Sure. John, can you speak to what you think uh, President Bush learned from his years in Midland and in Houston uh, in the oil business that contributed to his success in he, political world? He met a payroll. He ran a business. He, he understood the role of regulation, good and bad, in his, in his business. Uh, he had a tough, uh, there was a tough moment uh, prefiguring a lot of uh, the dramas uh, that we've seen since where uh, the Sid Richardson and uh, uh, some other folks wanted to drive him out of business because his dad was going vote to vote against the industry on a, on a, on a uh, particular issue. And so there are all these lobbyists would, I'm sure this doesn't happen now, but lobbyists, <laughs> you know, after about 5 p.m. it had just enough old crow uh, to, uh, to call the house and make threatening phone calls. And George H.W. Bush went up to see his dad, who was in the Senate, and his father said wisely, he said, look, they wouldn't dare try to run you out of business. I'm going to vote with my state, which was an energy uh, consuming state, not an energy producing one. Uh, and and, that, and it's, there's a sweet moment. This is in uh, Prescott Bush's oral history at Columbia University. Fascinating. It's about 800 pages. Uh, it's a great document. He says, um, sweetly, like a dad, uh, he says at the end of this, saying, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And if they do try to run you out of business, we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll, everything's going to be okay. It's a sweet sort of fatherly thing to say in, in the midst of that. Um, so uh, he ran a business. He built a business that he sold it for a lot of money in 1965-66. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. I mean, the re I, there's a reason I called this the American Odyssey. I mean, it, it is an odyssey from, from the war, I mean, from his, from his family, his great-grandfather, who was an uh, Episcopal clergyman who lost his faith, kind of redundant too, you know, with the, uh, uh, who, um, to the Gilded Age, to uh, the oil business, um, to all those jobs. I mean, it's a remarkable American saga. We shall not see his like again, I'm telling you. When do you believe uh, George Herbert Bush developed or recognized this elevated level of legacy, his duty to serve? His duty to serve, uh, well, there are, let, me, let me tell you two quick stories. Bennett McNichol. Uh, Bennett McNichol was an overweight kid at Greenwich Country Day School. And they were running the annual obstacle course race at Greenwich Country Day, and Bennett McNichol got stuck in a barrel. <laughs> And one of the glamorous guys who was probably going to win that race stopped to pull him out of that barrel and finish the race with him. And that was Poppy Bush. Story two. Andover, uh, a young kid named Bruce Gelb is being hazed. Uh, and here's a, here's a voice saying, leave the kid alone. And immediately the hazing stops. And Gelb says, who was that? And one of his hazers says, that's Poppy Bush. He's the best boy in the school. Um, and the third was on December 7th, 1941, when he immediately wanted to go to war to defend his country. Um, the first time I know that he mentions the presidency 
which is a detail in Mrs. Bush's diary, which she generously allowed me to, to read, uh, was in 1965 when in Houston, do you all remember a, a fellow named Ross Baker? Um, Ross Baker was going to challenge, uh, run against George H.W. Bush in the 1966 7th District primary. And so uh, George Bush goes over to meet with him. Ross Baker says, I'm thinking about running against you because I think you're going to use this as a stepping stone to the Senate. And Bush says, no, I'm trying to use it as a stepping stone to be president. <laughs> When I told George W. Bush that, he nearly fell off his chair. So last question. This, this may have come from an agent or somebody out there. Uh, again, not my, not my question. Um, would you consider writing Bill Clinton's biography? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do want to tell a final story about that, because that, 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 I think this tells you everything you need to know about everybody involved. Um, uh, Although I do, I do love what one of the things President Bush said about, Bill, about Hillary Clinton. He said, and tell me this is not a classic, a classic George Bush line. He says, we like her, but we don't know her, <laughs> which is a classic George Bush line. Um, I'm going to tell, tell the Umbunga story. Um, so I'm often asked, I've, I've been on, on the road now for six weeks talking about President Bush. It's been a great honor. The, doing this whole project has been a great honor. Um, the honor of a lifetime, really. Uh, the amount of access, the, the, the co no conditions. The only condition uh, was with Mrs. Bush's diary. I had to clear any quotations with her. Uh, I took her 90 pages of excerpts, and she read them. Uh, she took nothing off the record. It was a fascinating afternoon. Um, there was a moment where she was reading something, and she said, my, I was an opinionated 38-year-old. <laughs> Some things never change. Uh, <laughs> just, just got the evil eye. Not, not good. Um, shouldn't have done it. Uh, <laughs> So th I'm combining this. This is President Bush's story, President Bush 43 story, and I've put it together. So it's, it's a little bit like the Gospels. It may not be accurate, but it's true. <laughs> okay. So when, when, President, when President Bush 43 asks President Clinton and President Bush 41 to go do tsunami relief, they go to Washington before they leave. And President Clinton and President Bush 41 are in a motorcade going to the Indonesian embassy to sign the Book of Remembrance before they take off. President Bush 43 is about five minutes behind in a different motorcade. They arrive, 41 and 42, arrive at the Indonesian embassy. They get out, they walk in. Clinton sees a beautiful picture on the wall and he says, who painted that? <laughs> And the Indonesian ambassador says, oh, that is our great painter, Umbunga. And Clinton goes, that's great. I love that. <laughs> they go upstairs. They sign the book. They come back down. 43 is just walking in. Clinton grabs 43 and says, Mr. President, this is my favorite Umbunga ever. <laughs> I have followed his work for years. <laughs> and 41 says, no wonder this guy beat me. <laughs> thank you very much, John Meacham. Thank you, Ambassador Untermeyer. Thank you, President Bush and Mrs. Barbara Bush for joining us tonight. It's been a real honor. Thank you, David. And please, another reminder, the books are being sold outside by Brazos, and John has kindly uh, given us some extra time to sign and autograph the books. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening.